Please join us in welcoming to the stage Dolly Chug, award-winning social psychologist and author at the NYU Stern School of Business. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I'm really glad you're here. We're going to get right to work. I need you to help me with something. We're going to take a look at this next slide. And I'm going to ask you to say, if you're able to see the colors on this slide, I'm going to ask you to say the color out loud in unison. We're all going to do it together. So in other words, we're going to, when I say go, say green, red, purple, gr green, blue. And then I'll say second column, blue, yellow. Got it? Everybody got it? You ready? You in? All right, here we go. First column, green. Second column. Great. Third column. Awesome. Let's keep going. First column. What? Wait, what column are we on? Second column. I don't even know what column we're in. Yes. Oh my God, you guys are good. Man, the tenacity in this room. So it was kind of funny what just happened. Well, why was that hard? Would somebody, would somebody give me a sense of what was going on for them? What made that hard? What made it hard for you? You were laughing. Oh, you didn't even notice at first that I had switched it up on you. Who else had an experience of it being hard? What made it hard for you? Say it again. Their words made it hard. In the first slide, we can go back to it. Oops. In the first slide, there were gibberish. So you could just focus on one thing, the color of the font. But in the second slide, now there were two things. You had to unlearn looking at the color or unlearn looking at the letters and the meaning they form together. And in fact, these two things competed. What you were just doing is called the Stroop task. I'm a social psychologist, and we like coming up with these, these little games that reveal what goes on in our minds. And I think this task is going to help us think about the question we started with, and that I suspect you're grappling with if you're here in this session today. Can we love a country with a complicated past? For me, that country is the United States, the one I grew up in. Perhaps it's that, that the same for you, or perhaps there's another country. It might also be a community you're part of or a company you're part of. What happens when we love something with a complicated past? We're gonna tackle that question today thinking about what we can use from the tools of psychology to understand what it means to unlearn something. How do we take things we believe to be true, that we were taught to be true, and unlearn them? So let me tell you a story of a time when I realized how deeply I needed this help. This story begins, as many do, with me feeling rather proud of myself. Do I have any parents in the room today? Yeah. You know, there aren't too many moments as a parent where you're feeling really proud of yourself. So I was, I was like pulling a muscle, patting myself on the back with this one. I had decided I was going to read to my children every night the entire Little House on the Prairie book series. There are eight books, 200 plus pages each. This took a full year. Perhaps some of you are familiar with these books written by Laura Ingalls Wilder. These are the stories, the true stories of her family in the 1800s as they were part of the colonizing movement across what we now call the United States, building a home across against very difficult odds where they had to really pull together as a family. They worked hard. They had tenacity. They had a love for each other and for the country they were in. These are the values my husband and I are trying to teach our children. It was so perfect. Every night we would huddle together with the book 
And my kids got so invested in these stories. I have two daughters. You might notice this drawing one of my kids made has three daughters in it. Um, one of them is Laura because we're, they went to bed every night with stories of Laura in their head for a year, and I'm pretty sure they started to think she was real. My kids were maybe five and six at the time. So we were invested in these stories. So much so that we decided one summer, let's, for our family vacation, let's hit the road. Let's go to South Dakota and Minnesota the actual places where the Ingalls family lived, where they built a life. So we headed there. We went to the prairie. These are my two daughters wearing prairie dresses that, you bought and, that we bought in the general store. They wore them all week. And I mean, it was, it was magical watching them run through the prairie with a big blue prairie sky above us. And I remember standing there feeling proud until I had this thought flash through my head as I stood on the prairie. Like, wait, who, who's, whose land was this before they built their little house on the prairie. And I'm embarrassed to say that was not a question I was thinking deeply about for that whole year that I told my kids this story every night. Of course, there were Native American peoples living on that land. There were 60 million people living on this land And I wish I could tell you that in that moment, I Googled and I gathered and I contextualized that I seized this teaching moment and just took my parenting up a level. I wish I could tell you that. But here's what really happened. Guilt happened. Shame happened. Anger happened. Disbelief happened. Like, I really went down this, this thing in my brain of, wait, maybe? Is it possible the Ingalls family had some special, like, like deal? <laughs> of course, no. The answer is no. And they were a hardworking family. They were everything I had taught my kids. And... There were 60 million people that became 6 million people as a result of the systems and actions that were underway during those stories. And so, as I stood there wrestling with those emotions, wondering what to do with them, wondering why I couldn't process them, I think I just skipped a slide. I realized one of the things I was wrestling with is what I now call the Patriot's Dilemma. This dilemma that the more we love something, the harder it is for us to see it. The harder it is for us to see past the Instagram version of it, the filtered version of it. And it may go another way, or the harder it is for us to hold on to that love that we just go right, we just throw it out. And maybe you're in one of those places feeling lots of love, or feeling no love at all for a country you call home. And what I'm wondering, and what I've been wondering for the past decade since that trip, is what does it mean to love a country with a complicated past? What does it mean to unlearn some of what we had learned, and even some of what I had taught? my own children. Now, I mean, what is unlearning? You know, sometimes you just learn things, like check this one out. Did you know that elephants suck their trunks, little baby elephants, just like baby humans suck their thumbs? Isn't that amazing? I was today years old when I learned that. 
Did you know that the division symbol, the dot, line, dot, is a fraction with the dots as placeholders for numbers? Who knew that? Show offs. <laughs> the rest of us had no idea. We were today years old when we found that out. We are learning new things. We're not necessarily unlearning. Our beliefs are not necessarily being challenged. Let me give you another one. I was today years old when I learned that Dr. Martin Luther King, Anne Frank, and Barbara Walters, if they were all alive today, they would be the same age. What? I mean, Anne Frank, the 12-year-old girl whose journal from the Holocaust gave us insight into those horrors. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was one of the key leaders of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. These things happened a long time ago. But Barbara Walters just passed the veteran journalist a few months ago. I mean, she was on The View, like, day before yesterday, it seemed like. How could they all be the same age? Is there, now I'm having to unlearn something about something that was a long time ago, at least in my mind. It's challenging a belief I have. Unlearning, it turns out, is much harder than learning. Psychologists say it's almost like learning a new language at an older age to unlearn a belief. So let's keep going. This is Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. He's standing in front of an image, a series of names who are a subset of the hundreds of people he enslaved. Many of whom he enslaved while he was writing the Declaration of Independence. Equality, justice, freedom. I was today years old when I learned that, and it wasn't too long ago. I don't remember being taught that. Now I have to unlearn some things. I have to unlearn a narrative that I care deeply about. Land of the free, home of the brave. And perhaps you're at your own place in your journey with that narrative based on your own lived experience how your family, your ancestors have been treated. Perhaps you're seeing through the news story after story where we're taking things that happened a long time ago and bringing them into our vision today. Starting to connect the dots between the past and the present in a way that we hadn't done in the past. Perhaps that's where you are in your journey. What we do know very clearly is that today's disparities were planted yesterday, that every, every meaningful life outcome, at least in the United States, shows a significant racial disparity. And that didn't emerge today. We may be today years old when we're noticing it or digging into it, but it started yesterday. So this story, these stories we tell ourselves, these stories I told my children, this moment on the prairie, these emotions I was feeling, they were stopping me from looking at yesterday. And yet, if I don't look at yesterday, how can I look at today? That's what I've been grappling with. And we talk so much about lifelong learning. I mean, this has been really exciting to be here at South By. It's like a big old lifelong learning conference. I, I feel like curiosity is just like oxygen here. We're all just breathing it. 
But lifelong learning won't help us solve those problems. We will have to do some lifelong unlearning as well. But I have good news. There's so much good content out there today. Some of you might have been, anybody at Heather McGee's talk this morning? It was fantastic, wasn't it? Some of us, her book. I think we sat near each other for a moment. Um, there's so much good content, movies, activists. So we can intellectually do this work. We can cognitively do this work. We, our heads know what it needs to do. We know how to use Google. The external stuff is there. Historians are contributing more and more. But I would argue, because I'm a psychologist, that's not going to get us there. Because standing on the prairie, my problem wasn't that I didn't have Google. It wasn't that I didn't no. I mean, I, there's a lot I don't know. I'm, I should be clear. I'm not a historian. I'm not even really a history buff. I, I don't know if we get the History Channel at home. I have no idea. But like you, I, I'm surrounded by the past, by holidays, by stories in my family, by movies I love about the past, and they're all feeding me a narrative. And when that narrative turns out to be something I need to unlearn, it becomes the work of emotions. Sentimental heart work that we have to do inside of us, not just outside of us. And this is where psychologists can help. This is where together, if we bring our hearts and heads to bear upon this problem, psychological tools might be exactly what we need. And so I said, as I realized this over the past decade, awesome, let me find the book that does it. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. The books were all speaking to my head, but not to my heart. And so I wondered if this was a place I could contribute as a social psychologist, as someone who thinks about how people think and how people feel, how they engage with each other, how they engage with experiences in their memories and in their past. And perhaps I could take the research that others have done and that I have done and curate together stories and science to create an evidence-based psychological toolkit. So what I want to offer you today is a flavor of that with four of the tools that I cover in the book. The first one is to see the problem, to just begin by noticing where the problem lies. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna scan the room for your reactions to this picture to see who knows what this is. All right, I got in the red, the red sweater. She's taking a picture of it. She loves it so much. Can you tell me what this is? It's a Viewmaster, and what is a Viewmaster for those who don't know? Exactly. It shows you pictures on this little wheel and you click through. It's like a little handheld projector. And why are you so excited to take pictures of this? Yeah. And what are your memories of it? What? You're at the world's biggest tech entertainment conference and you're telling us you have a view master in your office now. Why? Yeah. Good memories. Yeah, and you like toys. So there's a bunch of people here, most of you who have no idea what we're talking about are under 30. <laughs> you have no nostalgia whatsoever for this toy. It doesn't give for you a sentimental feeling or tie to your social identity or bolster your sense of collective pride. I mean, we just had a moment bonding on our Viewmaster. That was something. But what psychologist tells us is nostalgia, it is psychologically powerful. It's also economically powerful. Billions of dollars spent, music, fashion, toys, 
travel, entertainment, nostalgia sells. Now, your nostalgia may be different nostalgia. When we were, when we were doing the tech check, by the way, you have no idea the ecosystem of people working in, in this room and behind this room and in other parts of this convention center to make this work right now. It's amazing, yes! One of them is Dan on sound there. When we were going through this and this picture came up, Dan told us the most amazing story from his childhood about saving all his money to buy this Game Boy Color and his buddy and how they would play and why it was so cool. Different nostalgia for different people. Nostalgia is addictive. It is seductive. And nostalgia is often tied to identities we care about. The lens of our social identity will often drive the nostalgia we're drawn to. For me, from New York, a Hindu child of Indian immigrants, a little bit addicted to pickleball, anybody? Yes, oh my God, you and I have so much in common. <laughs> a parent, a professor, you, you challenge the narratives, the beliefs. You ask me to unlearn the stories tied to these identities. And it's tough for me. It's tough for me because history may be what I need to know, but the nostalgia is what I want to hear. So we begin in our toolkit. We first see the problem. When our beliefs are, are challenged, when we have to unlearn them, when I have to say on that prairie, it's true, the Ingalls family was incredible. They were both the most ordinary of families and the most extraordinary of families. All of that is true. And so were the families they displaced. There's some grief. And if we're to see the problem, we have to expect to feel that grief. That it's normal, but it needn't stop us. Like all grief, we have to work through it. We have to see the problem. Our second tool in loving a country with a complicated past and being able to deal with our emotional relationship with our country and the systemic inequities that persist is to embrace paradox. Now, this one came to me as I was interviewing May Mayor Mitch Landrieu. Any, anyone from New Orleans here? Yeah, hello, hello, welcome. Um, you're probably familiar and others may be as well. Mitch Landrieu uh, got national visibility when he decided to take on the challenge of taking down Confederate statues on public land in the city of New Orleans. Now, Mayor Landrieu, his, his family has been in New Orleans for generations. In fact, his father used to be mayor of New Orleans. And when I was interviewing him, it was over the phone, I, I wanted to talk to him about tearing down these statues. And we got on the phone and he just kept talking about, he was building and he was visioning and he had this amazing meeting with Wynton Marsalis, also from New Orleans, asking him to help him rebuild after Hurricane Katrina. And Marsalis said yes and take down those monuments. And Mayor Landrieu realized that while he had lived in that city his whole life and walked by those statues a million times, he had never thought carefully about what they represented, especially in such prominent public government spaces. And yet as I spoke to him, expecting him to tell me about tearing them down, he kept talking about building this city 
and building the future. And y'all, I was ready to move to New Orleans. I mean, it was like very persuasive. <laughs> but halfway through, I was like, um, Mayor, sir, thank you. I, I'm so interested in how you are building the city, but I'm also interested in what you're tearing down from the past. Can we talk more about that? Can you help me reconcile how you keep talking about building and tearing down? It seems like a contradiction. And he said, without missing a beat, most of the time you're living in a contradiction. Yes, most of the time you are living in a contradiction, in a paradox. Paradox is when two statements, both true, contradict each other. And I realized that contradiction and paradox define this country's history. Thomas Jefferson wrote extraordinary documents, had extraordinary visions, overcame extraordinary odds, and showed extraordinary brutality. He's one of many examples of that in our history. And my brain wants to pick one. It wants to pick one side of this story. But how, if both are true? How do we simply cover one side or the other? In doing that, aren't we doing what I was doing on the prairie and just covering one side or the other? The good news is, while our brains want consistency, want to straighten that picture on the wall, want things to line up, our brains also have evolved to be able to handle the fact that we do live in contradiction. And the way we can activate a paradox mindset in our minds is simply to tell our brains, it's okay. Let them both exist in contradiction. And when we do that, when we simply activate a paradox mindset by telling our brains, it's okay, this unsolvable puzzle does not have to be solved, we unleash a whole bunch of benefits. Wendy Smith and other scholars have shown that we learn more. We are more agile. We're more cognitively flexible. We're more open to experience tolerant of ambiguity, capable of complex thinking. We're more creative and we're more resilient. Gosh, don't we need a little more creativity and resilience right now in this world? So that's our second tool. It's just to let our brain know it's okay. Let the paradox stand. And in fact, one thing I've started to do is become a bit of an overenthusiastic paradox spotter because you really start to see them everywhere. Your workplace, full of paradox. Your company's history, full of paradox. South by, full of paradox. Your family, oh, oh, full of paradox. Once you allow the paradox to stand, you unleash the resilience. Once you allow the paradox to stand, you unleash the creativity. Once you allow the paradox to stand, you have another tool in your toolkit on how to love a country with a complicated past. Our third tool, reject racial fables. For this one, I wanna tell you a story about Louise McCauley. Louise McCauley, when she was growing up in the 30s and 40s, she was feisty. Her grandmother worried that she would be lynched before she was 20. She openly worried about this for her daughter, her granddaughter. Her family actually moved to a different part of town 
in with relatives because the way Louise had to walk to school, this was the Jim Crow era, she was expected as a black girl to move off the sidewalk when the white kids were passing, but she refused to do so. And her family was so worried for her safety, they literally moved. When she was old enough to vote, she had to go three times through onerous hoops to register to vote, documenting away all the way all the, the problems they were giving her registering to vote. She was one of only 3% of black Americans while eligible to vote who were actually allowed to register to vote. She kept going back. When she graduated high school, she got a job, but she spent her evenings volunteering for the NAACP. On her lunch break, she would call colleges, speak to students, encouraging them to organize and stage protests. She was actively involved in multiple, in the planning of multiple acts of civil disobedience and building a legal defense fund for those involved. I mean, you know this story, right? Because Louise McCauley is, other than US presidents and first ladies, the most recognizable name in the United States. Surely you've heard of her, Rosa Louise Macaulay Parks. How many of you knew the story I just told you? Very few of us. I didn't know it. I was today years old until I read and then started to dig deeper into the work of historian Jean Thea Harris. The book was recently made into a documentary as well, produced by Soldat O'Brien. What's interesting is Theo Harris published this book just in the last five to 10 years. It is the first footnoted, historian-driven academic biography of Rosa Parks. How can that be? Well, it seems that there's a fable that we've all learned about a tired seamstress, an accidental activist, an elderly black woman. My friends, she was 42. And she was not an accidental activist. And she never claimed she was. In fact, she tried to tell her story. But the story we just kept telling ourselves was a different one. It was one in which there was this clear cause and effect. They did a thing and then a thing happened. She did a thing, she sat down on the bus, or she, she stayed seated, seated on the bus. The, 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 the uh, citizens of Montgomery boycotted the bus system. Dr. King came in, noted that there were some changes that needed to be made. Everyone jumped on board, high-fived each other, and here we are. Clear cause and effect, so linear. A clear sign of a fable. Because in fact, there had been many attempts by many people that hadn't gotten momentum leading up to that moment. In fact, that protest while that specific day, they didn't know it was gonna be that day, they had been talking for a while about Rosa Parks taking this action. They meaning her and her fellow activists and organizers. Flawless individual heroes. Fables often have them. The stories are ones in which we can sort of elevate a single individual and view them in two dimensional terms as all good. And third, in fables, the good guys always beat the bad guys. See, those failed attempts before, nobody high-fived. There was no boycott, and there was no change, no immediate discernible change. So the good guys didn't beat the bad guys. But that doesn't make for a good story. 
So the fables we've told ourselves that allow us to feel like we got it right the first time. Sit in our history. They sit in our nostalgia. And they make it really difficult for us to recognize how change actually happens. Because change doesn't happen like a wheel rolling like this. It happens like a brick that kind of rolls forward and backward. I don't know who to credit with that metaphor, but I love it. And if we buy into the Rosa Parks fable, then we're going to dismiss the real Rosa Parks of today. You know, when they, in our meetings, when they're, they're angry, or in our communities when they're divisive and they just won't let it go. And by they, maybe I mean you. And we dismiss them because we say, you know, if your tone, I think if you got, if you just toned it down a little, or, you know, that's obviously not getting us anywhere. Why are you doing that? You're just making things more divisive. Not realizing that that's just a fable about how change happens and not how it actually happens. So by, by telling ourselves a story about the past that was never true, it's making, us, making it difficult for us in the present to see change, be part of change, recognize change where it is happening. So our third tool and our psychological toolkit of loving a country with a complicated past is to reject the racial fable, to use those three red flags, clear cause and effect, flawless individual heroes, good guys beating bad guys, always beating bad guys, to be a sign that this might not be how things actually happened. Our fourth tool in our toolkit is to build grit. I'm scanning the room to see who looks like they know who this is. Who can give me? Oh my gosh, I love it. Who is it? And who is that? Oh, you're, you're a Trekkie. All right, so George Takei from the original, original cast of Star Trek. And George is still acting today, like literally today, he's in London performing in Allegiance, which is the Broadway show that he helped create, along with a book he wrote, and constant amplification he's trying to give of the story of his family and 120,000 other Japanese Americans, who in World War II were put in by the U.S. government what were called internment camps. It's an interesting euphemism because what they were were places that people, including children, were removed from their homes, taken hundreds or thousands of miles away, put behind barbed wire with soldiers with guns keeping them from leaving for years. When George was four years old, the soldiers showed up at his family's door He's over 80 now. When I interviewed him for my book, I could hear the emotion in his voice, remembering something that happened 80 years ago and particularly remembering his mother's face when they showed up at their door. His family, like so many others, had done nothing wrong. They were imprisoned for a crime they never committed in anticipation that they might commit a crime someday. And he has committed himself to telling the story, lest it be forgotten. And so when I interviewed him, I wanted to understand, because he's also such an advocate, a fan, a patriot of the United States. He's so actively involved, so civically involved. And I wanted to understand that. 
We get on the phone, and my name's Dolly, and he starts singing, Hello, Dolly, to me. And as we talk, and he's explaining to me, I'm hearing everything we've talked about here. The paradox is real. He's describing President Roosevelt, who issued the executive order that imprisoned his family, that led to his family losing years of their life, their home, their small business, their savings. Everything left them jobless and homeless when they were released. They got $25 and a train ticket when they were released. And he describes his president as having made a terrible mistake and as having been a great president who built roads and infrastructure we needed, led us during difficult, dark times, but also made a horrible mistake. And again, I'm talking and I'm like, how can you... How can you keep going? You're encouraging people to vote. You're actively involved in policy issues today. How are you doing this 80 years after that? And I realized as I talked to him that I was hearing what psychologist Angela Duckworth calls grit. You may be familiar with her research or a TED talk or her book. And while the the concept of grit has been very widely applied to many areas. I don't think it's been applied to patriotism. Because what I realized is what George was describing to me was exactly grit. It was passion and perseverance towards a meaningful long-term goal. And that was the country he saw that he believed we could be that he didn't expect it to be an easy love of country. He expected he would have to work for it. He didn't feel entitled to an easy love of country. He didn't feel like it was just about wearing the right colors or celebrating the right holidays or singing the right song. It was an active stance he would take. And so I wondered if perhaps he's modeling for us what it means to be a gritty patriot. And patriot, I don't know, that's become a charged word. But really it means someone who loves their country. And might that be a path for us where we could have passion and perseverance for the meaningful long-term goal of a more just Fill in the blank. Is it the team you work on? Is it the company you work in or that you lead? Is it your community, your neighborhood, your country, the world, the future? Might there be a path where we have to take an active stance of passion and perseverance? Might that be yet another tool? Because we show grit in so many parts of our lives. I bet you have a project, a hobby, a health issue, a family situation, a work goal, a passion where you are gritty. I know I do. Maybe I could take my ability to be gritty and apply it to my ability to love my country. Maybe if I had been gritty on the prairie, I would have seen a way to navigate that situation. What might be possible in the home of the gritty? Maybe we could see today differently because we see yesterday more clearly. Can we love a country with a complicated past? I'm going to say yes. Yes. In fact, I'm going to argue that we must love a country with a complicated past. 
Because to simply dismiss it or to blindly embrace it is not to do the work, the gritty work it will take to make it better. And we have the tools to do it. We have the tools, the evidence-based, science-based tools. In my book, I put, I put them one per chapter, seven tools total, and we've covered highlights from four of them. And together, I think these tools set us up. They set us up to love a country that hasn't gotten it right every time, but that has the potential. And I want to share with you, I told you at the beginning about my, my kids and how I taught them, how I fed them every night. And for years, I fed them a narrative. One of our kids wrote a poem for school last year. They're now almost 18 and almost 17. I know. That's what I say. Blink of an eye. It's true what they say. So one of them wrote a poem for school that she showed me after she had submitted it. I'm going to read it to you. I just realized I need my glasses, so we're going to go back. Here we go. The psychic wound of racism resulted in inevitable wounds in the land and the country itself. Central Park wasn't always the wealthy New York child's playground. It was a black oasis. It was Seneca Village. The Sawatch Range wasn't always the place wealthy New York kids escaped to. It was the mountain sand dunes. It was, and still is, the home of the Ute people. A false, in quotes, destiny. The sense of entitlement. A need for more privilege. People stole this land. Stole homes. Stole livelihoods. Now recreating in these places, I read the signs. I acknowledge the land, but it is not enough. It will never be enough. So what's next? I didn't teach her that. But you did. Teachers did. Content creators did. Activists did, community leaders did, business leaders did, entrepreneurs did. Because each of us, each of us has an opportunity to shape the narrative. Each of us has a chance to unlearn and teach. And we don't need all of us to do it. We only need some of us. Change has never happened. That's another racial fable because all of us or even most of us were on board. It has never happened that way. It happened because some of us decided to make change. So let's keep growing together. Let's keep learning together. In my newsletter every month, I share my struggles to learn, also Coco being the wonder puppy. And whatever I'm passionate about at the time, whether it be Wordle or Pickleball or Disco Night, how I'm grappling with it, and what are the tips that are science-based but practical and actionable that we can use? What are the ways in which we it doesn't have to be all of us, but it must be some of us can build a more just future. Thank you.
So we're going to go to Q&A, and there is a Slido on the app if you want to do that. But we've already got questions up here, so I'm going to dive right in. By the way, that's two-year-old me doing Q&A. Get it? Uh, and for those who are heading out, just so you know, there is a book signing right after this. Uh, the bookstore, they wanted me to let you know, does close at 530, however. So we don't have a big margin there. Okay. Mm. These are great. All right. So I'm going to start with one that I think a lot of us feel, and it's an anonymous question. It says, I feel motivated to begin, but also overwhelmed. What is an easy action item I can take right away? And I really appreciate this question because it, it speaks to the fact that we are dealing with systemic, long-term challenges that these seeds were planted over hundreds of years and they aren't going to be unplanted immediately. But yes, there are things we could take starting today, literally today. It begins, I think, with thinking about the content we're consuming. So whatever content you love, maybe it's movies, you're in the right place, maybe it's music, maybe it's books, maybe it's podcasts, maybe it's sports, maybe it's video games, Whatever it is, think about the last 10 units of it you consumed. Think about how similar the identities of the voices that are centered are to your own and to each other. I mean, literally, like, just jot it out and count. And see if there's an opportunity there doing something you already love doing to mix it up a bit. Because if you start hearing different voices and different stories, you'll start to hear, you'll start to unlearn, you'll start to challenge some of the beliefs you've come to form. And so this little content audit is so easy because it's something you're already doing you're not adding any work. It's not eating vegetables. It's eating dessert because you already love doing it. It's just giving you a bigger dessert menu. And I think what you'll find is you'll hear different histories, different heritages, different fables, and different backstories that you haven't heard in the past uh, represented in the stories that you've heard. So let's, that's one place to start. And that can start here at South By. What is the value? Yeah, that's, that's this really interesting question. Um, Dan is asking, what is the value of loving your country? Is it even an important goal to strive for? Why not simply live in the paradox without assigning emotional value? I love that, Dan. Thank you. Um, so I think if you are able to do that, that's a powerful and, and, and valuable way to live, to live sort of in a state of neutrality. And, and of course, we know countries our social constructs, right? Boundaries and all of that. Uh, we don't have to accept that. However, for many people, the psychological need to have our social identities tie us to a group is an important craving. So if for you that is not a strong psychological need, then I think you can absolutely uh, let go of this idea of loving a country and simply living in the paradox. But for many others, there's a need to have a sense of an aff affinity or to note that that sense of affinity has been lost. And you may be at various states in that, each of you in your own journey, a strong sense of affinity or a sense of affinity that you, you've lost. Um, I think by finding a space there where you can hold the paradox, uh, hold the paradox to be true while not abandoning that love, that's where the action is. What I'm trying to avoid myself and I'm trying to encourage others and reach as many hearts and minds as I can with these tools is that we simply shut down because we don't know how to love a country and see the hard stuff. And so we shut down, like I did on the prairie. So thank you, Dan, for that question. Ah, 
All right. Um, we have an anonymous question. How do you propose immigrants who have not really been embedded in the deep troubling history to engage in conversations and change? Thank you for that. Um, so my family immigrated here. I was actually born in India, but I was six months old when my family came here. And so I certainly can understand um, this question. And if you're a more recent immigrant, um, I can understand that you, you might have uh, experienced this more as an adult than as a child, as I did. One thing I would think about is, um, so I think the good news is you have less to unlearn about like if you haven't gone, uh, I looked back at the uh, World Book Encyclopedia that I grew up with. My parents still have it in their homes. Um, see, an encyclopedia is a series of books <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, so we used to have encyclopedias. And so I actually looked up um, some entries recently and nowhere did it mention well, I shouldn't say nowhere. I did not read the whole encyclopedia. But in the entry I was looking at, it did not mention that many of our founding fathers were enslaving humans. Uh, there was no mention of that in that entry. And it, it was the entry about slavery. Um, so I have more to unlearn than perhaps somebody who hasn't gone through that. Uh, so I would say one thing, an immigrant who has not really been in, embedded in the deep troubling history, uh, to sort of take advantage that you have less to unlearn. It'll be easier for you to sort of act and move without having to like deal with all this emotional stuff. So I'd say that's good. Um, the other thing is to engage in conversations and change. I would be careful of, um, like my family when we came here, I, there was... I think a narrative around uh, the immigration law and the way it was sort of like, let's go get immigrants from India and bring them here, engineers and doctors, and we're so psyched for them to come. That was the narrative I had heard my whole life. But what I've learned subsequently is that there was actually deep controversy in 1965 when that immigration law was passed. It was coming in the immediate... Um, immediately after the 1964 civil rights legislation. And in fact, when it was passed, the way it got through Congress was with assurances that it wouldn't lead to more immigrants from non-European countries. And so that was not how I thought we got here. Um, so I'd be careful if you've come here with a certain understanding of the immigrant narrative that you're bringing with you that you've really looked up, so the, the real story, so that you don't put yourself in a position of seeing yourself as somehow exceptional as opposed to sort of part of what's happening, about the beneficiary and perhaps a target of what's happening. I think we have time for one more. Um, Amy asks, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is I work in a university. I'm a professor at New York University. And wow, the young people, the young people, a lot of them are you. You are the young people. It's impressive. It's impressive how um, much conviction there is it's impressive how much um, courage there is. It's impressive this ability to be both deeply cynical and deeply hopeful at the very same time is impressive. So what I've been trying to do is listen more to people younger than me, I'm 55, is to listen to the 45, 35, 25, and 15 year olds reverse mentoring, if you will, because they notice see things and see things that my eye misses, that I have normalized in the world around me. And that's made it both easier for me and also so much more hope-driven than I could do on my own. We really don't need everyone on board. We need some of us on board 
And I think we can do it. I think we can do it with psychological tools and with hope. We can build a more just future. Thank you again.